Listen to these two notes. Although they are both the same pitch, you should be able to tell that one was played by a violin and one by a trumpet. My question is, despite both of these notes having exactly the same pitch, why are you able to differentiate between these two sound waves? We're told that the amplitude of a wave is how loud it sounds, and the frequency corresponds to the pitch, so what property of waves allows us to create different sounding sounds? These questions may sound basic, but the theory behind the explanations is vital to modern sound production, and makes use of physics used in acoustics, mechanics and quantum theory. To understand this, we need to go back to the two clips I played at the start. The characteristic sound of an instrument is known as timbre, so violins sound different to trumpets because they have different timbres. This is something that seems obvious, but is used so much in orchestral music, where certain timbres can evoke certain emotions or qualities. In terms of a sound wave, timbre can be thought of as the overall shape of a wave, with different instruments creating different waves. My original question as to why timbre should exist still stands, however, as why should a vibrating string create a complex pattern like this, when we are taught that vibrating strings look smooth and sinusoidal, and why should a vibrating string create a different pattern to a vibrating column of air? And also, why do expensive or old violins typically sound better? What is it about these waves that improves the quality of a sound? These are all important questions with more physics behind them than you might realise, and my goal in this video is to at least try to convey how ordinary processes in our lives can be broken down into deep and fundamental questions concerning physics. Let's start by taking a closer look at these waves. When we listen to a note coming from an instrument, the sound that we hear is not just the note pitch which we recognise, but also consists of many much quieter harmonics. For instance, a violin playing an A natural will not only be producing that A natural note, but also other harmonics with different pitches. These harmonics add together in a process known as superposition to form this messy wave which we can see now. The only problem is, it's hard to tell what harmonics are in the sound by just looking at the wave, and this is something we'll need to do to interpret why instruments sound different. Luckily, there is some neat maths which can help to transform a messy signal into the component harmonics, a tool known as the Fourier transform. Fourier analysis is a topic which can take up an entire video, and 3Blue1Brown has a fantastic video which explains it without any maths. I'd highly recommend watching that if you're interested. The fundamentals of Fourier transforms are that they take a signal in the time domain, so a graph with time on the x-axis, and transform it to a graph in the frequency domain. What this means in terms of waves is that you can take a messy signal like this one and apply a Fourier transform which will unravel the signal and determine what frequencies of waves were added together. This corresponds to a graph with frequency on the x-axis, showing how much of each frequency of wave was added to make the original signal. Using this, we can determine the intensity of each harmonic by translating frequency into pitch, and so gain an idea as to what harmonics are in any sound and how loud they are. The Fourier transform is an incredibly powerful technique which is used in many areas of physics, and it's in applications like these where it proves just how useful it is. Using this, I was able to find samples and analyse them. The following clips show the instruments and their respective Fourier transforms. Although this isn't the best setup, as the files weren't recorded with the same mic and may have gone through compression, it still shows how the sounds of different instruments are made up of different harmonics, and the relative intensity or loudness of each harmonic. However, I still have questions about the origins of these harmonics, as how do you go from a vibrating string to multiple frequencies like we can see? Let's take a look at the vibration of a string again. When a string is plucked or an air column vibrated, fixed waves are set up on the string or in the air called standing waves. The basic rules for standing waves are quite simple. An end that is fixed cannot move, and an open end, such as the bell of a trumpet, can move the most. Using these constraints, only particular frequencies of waves can form. It's not quite as simple as either having a string vibrating at one frequency or at another, however. In reality, when a string is plucked, the resulting wave is not smooth or sinusoidal, but actually appears to be made of straight sections with kinks in them. 
These waves were discovered by Hermann von Helmholtz, and can be thought of as adding all of our previous standing waves together, with the higher frequencies contributing less than the lower frequencies. Since the string is vibrating with many frequencies, we get a signal out of the vibrating string with many harmonics, as opposed to just one frequency. This is only half the story though, as there are many stringed instruments which all sound very different, with instruments of the same type even sounding different. So how does this work? The vibrations of a wave in one dimension are much simpler than the vibrations of waves in two dimensions. These are Kladni plates, named after physicist Ernst Kladni. In 1787, Kladni published his findings on a setup in which he bowed a metal plate which had sand on it, creating different patterns. These patterns aren't dissimilar from the standing waves which we saw earlier though, in fact they are two-dimensional standing waves. As the plate vibrates, the sand is moved from places where the plate is moving a lot, to points where there is no movement at all, and as the frequency of the oscillator driving the plate changes, the two-dimensional standing wave changes, and so the pattern follows suit. The patterns of these plates have some surprising applications in physics, especially in quantum mechanics, where the shapes on the plates are related to the solutions of the Schrodinger equation. The important part here is that Kladni's findings could be translated to the vibrations of the body of a violin, or any instrument which uses a box setup to amplify the sound. As vibrations from the bridge travel through the body of the violin, the back plate vibrates with a certain pattern, or mode, depending on the frequency of the string vibration. This means that the back plate of a violin can be crafted in such a way that it amplifies certain frequencies more, which will change the quality of the sound. In terms of our Fourier transform, and the weighting of the harmonics, this is one of the missing steps in converting our string wave profile to the sound which actually reaches your ears, meaning that the construction of an instrument can have a huge impact on the sound of it, depending on the material properties used, thickness and overall shape. Instrument makers have known this for years, but it's only in more recent years that we've been able to apply the science to craft nice sounding plates for violins. In fact, modern violin makers have had so much success with using this analysis to make violins that in many studies, professional violin players were unable to tell the difference between the sound of modern violins and violins from 300 years ago made by Stradivari, with these instruments often costing millions of dollars. This doesn't just apply to violins, as most instruments have some way of amplifying and changing the quality of the sound produced, and our knowledge of what harmonics to emphasise to make a particular tone of sound is widely applicable. In modern music production, experienced producers can tweak the balance of these harmonics in order to achieve the desired sound, along with other things such as how fast the sound decays, as well as the attack and sustain. So, the next time that you listen to a piece of music, or play a particularly nice sounding instrument, you can be satisfied in knowing why the tone or timbre sounds so unique to that track or instrument, and why it was chosen to evoke certain emotions or display certain qualities, which, at the end of the day, is the beauty of music. This is only a short video on one small aspect of music, and I hope you found it informative. Do let me know in the comments if this type of video is interesting. I'm still learning and trying to provide content which I find interesting, so any feedback you have would be greatly appreciated. As always, thank you for watching. I'm going to be making a new video every week for the next month or so, so I'll see you next week.